Just like any piece of media, there are a multitude of genres within the video game industry. Platformers, shooters, turn-based strategy games, fighters, etc, etc. Sometimes new genres are brought into existence from either new technological advancements or game design principles. And sometimes, games are even born from a combination of designs and ideas that lack a good name. Metroidvanias, a portmanteau of the Metroid and Castlevania franchise respectively, is one of the biggest genres in gaming today, and even so, it is still a hard genre to nail down. There can be a number of gameplay mechanics implemented, but the core is almost always the same. A non-linear world players have to explore with power-ups, items, or abilities that players can obtain and be used to progress farther into the game. Some games might have an emphasis on combat, where others might have an emphasis on platforming, or some even have a combination of both. Needless to say, it's a complicated genre, making it equally as difficult to develop, so when a Metroidvania-style game succeeds, it does so with flying colors. One such example is Moon Studios' debut title, Ori in the Blind Forest. Initially released in March of 2015 for the Xbox One, a definitive version was released one year later. This definitive edition is what we'd be looking at today, as it is aptly named, adding new areas and mechanics as well as improving visuals and performance. Ori in the Blind Forest is simply a joy in almost every department. From the story, gameplay, visuals, and music, everything comes together just right to culminate into one very special title. Players take control of the titular Ori, a guardian spirit who, during a great storm, is separated from the spirit tree of the Forest of Nibel. Ori is soon found and adopted by the forest dweller Naru. In an opening sequence that rivals Pixar's Up, Naru and Ori help each other in finding food and building a home together in the forest. Their time together together is unfortunately cut short, as a cataclysmic event soon causes the spirit tree to lose its power, resulting in the forest withering to nothing. With their food supply gone, Naru passes away, leaving Ori on her own once again. Ori is soon aided by the spirit orb Saiyan and is tasked with returning the three elements of light to the spirit tree, restoring life, and saving Nibel from the ominous owl Kuro who stalks the skies. Ori's narrative, while simple, is elevated by its fantastic visual style and nuanced characters. The prologue is especially powerful, showing the friendship between Ori and Naru, ending in a gut punch of Naru's death, propelling Ori and the player on the same goal to bring life back to their home. There's a short yet memorable list of characters along the way like Gumo, the shy yet mischievous last survivor of a race of builders, Saiyan, your guiding partner throughout your adventure and the spirit tree itself who acts as the narrator. The main antagonist, Kuro, is especially interesting as she harasses the player throughout the journey. Acting as the main threat throughout the game, Kuro is more complex than just her one-note villain types, as it's revealed that she is only looking to protect her last egg, as her children were inadvertently killed by the spirit tree's last-ditch attempt to find Ori. Ori is a very emotionally driven game, especially the conclusion which is incredibly powerful. Ori's journey constantly tugs on your heartstrings and invests you in its world as you push forward to not only explore the rest of Nibel, but also see how the story unfolds, complementing the gameplay beautifully. As previously mentioned, Ori is a metroidvania with a bit of Zelda inspiration. It's heavy on the platforming and more hands-off when it comes to combat. Ori might be one of the most smoothest platforming experiences I've ever had. Just like Celeste, Ori has just the right amount of weight to be controllable in the mid-air, but light enough to land even the trickiest of jumps. Wall running, dashing, and double jumping all come into play as Ori obtains more abilities and grows stronger, and it expands the platforming tremendously. It feels amazing to control in part because it looks beautiful in motion. I'll touch on the visuals in due time, but the animation is so well done it perfectly conveys the weight and floatiness of Ori, so much so it makes the whole experience feel all that more natural to control. There's a flow with Ori that's entrancing, where you can run, jump, climb, and bounce with ease. This makes traversing each area incredibly fun on its own, only improved when abilities and upgrades enter the mix. To start off, there are three main collectibles as it were throughout the world. Green life shards, blue energy orbs, and yellow spirit light, which contribute towards your health, your soul, and your ability points respectively. Collecting enough spirit light will grant the player an ability point, which I will touch upon in a bit. Players can expand their health and energy by collecting cells hidden throughout the world. It goes without saying that having more health is always a plus, especially because Ori is a bit old school when it comes to saving and progression. Very rarely does the blind forest auto-save for you, so players have to manually save by using the soul link, eating up one of your full energy cells here. Soul links save all your progress up to that point from important 
certain story elements to items collected. It will not save any of your progress going forward until another soul link is created. In theory, I think this system is actually pretty neat, as you have to put thought into when you want to create a soul link or when you want to save those energy cells. It's a bit of a backhanded compliment, but there's a problem with this system as the game can be so fun and engaging, one can forget to save for quite some time. This can result in a lot of progress lost, which can be frustrating, although I do admit this is less of a game design issue and more of a me issue. Like most Metroidvanias, there are areas inaccessible to the player because they don't possess the right item or ability to progress. Ori is no different, having areas where double jumping or a stomp attack are necessary to reach that ledge or break through that barrier. The real enjoyment of the Metroidvania genre is that aha moment, epiphanies the player gets once they obtain a new ability or upgrade, remembering that door they couldn't open or that path they couldn't reach. By finding ancestral trees around the world, Ori can learn various skills, over 10, to aid in her journey. Double jumping, dashing, gliding, wall jumping, bashing, and climbing are some of the abilities Ori can obtain, and while they seem basic, they add to a great sense of progression. Starting from nothing and eventually building your powers and strength throughout the game is the backbone of the Metroidvania genre, and Ori continuously makes you feel like you're making progress and getting stronger not through heavier attacks or stronger armor, but opening up more avenues for traversal. I find this to be a lot more satisfying, as platforming and exploring are some of my favorite activities in any game. It's a great feeling grabbing the climbing or wall jump ability and immediately getting excited knowing I can now access an area or make that jump I couldn't before. I'm fond of the abilities that differ from the norm. Abilities like Kuro's Feather that allows Ori to glide over large distances or catch gusts of wind to traverse more vertical areas, and Bash that allows Ori to slow down time and bounce off enemies or projectiles, sailing in one direction as said enemy or projectile goes the opposite way. This is used to tremendous effect in platforming sections and puzzles. In tandem with basic skills, Ori also has access to an ability tree of sorts. This is accessed via the aforementioned Soul Links, where players can spend the ability points they've earned into three separate categories, utility, efficiency, and combat. Utility abilities aid in survival and defense, efficiency abilities are tailored for more convenient exploration, and combat abilities enhance Ori's offensive capabilities. This skill tree is great for tailoring the game to how you want to play. Each ability cell you gain or find throughout your adventure can be applied to one of the three categories, increasing in cost the more effective the ability. I found myself trying to even out the tree as I progressed, but I found more abilities in the utility and efficiency tree more useful than the combat one based on my playstyle. It adds a light RPG element that gives the game more replayability. And speaking of combat, the combat in Ori of the Blind Forest is a surprising aspect for me. Usually, Metroidvania combat can be hit or miss, no pun intended. It can be solid and add to the experience, but if it's difficult to grasp or just plain bad, it can ruin it, and that was how most of my attempts at getting into the Metroidvania genre went. Combat is more akin to a shoot 'em up almost, where spamming the fire button will hone in on the closest enemy. It's a system that works well, as it's almost a fire and forget kind of approach, leaving the player to focus on their platforming or puzzling. Ori's combat is very hands-off, and more of a secondary mechanic rather than the bulk of the gameplay, and I feel, at least personally, that it's for the best. Just like your traversal options, combat opens up the further you progress in the game and the more abilities you acquire. In tandem with the Spirit Flame ability, Ori can also use a Charge Flame to either break through barriers in the overworld or perform an area of effect blast, dealing damage to enemies all around you. This can be useful when overwhelmed by multiple enemies or enemies with larger health bars. Similar to the Charge Flame, Stomp allows Ori to break through weak footing throughout the world, but will also do damage and stun certain enemies. The Bash ability I mentioned can also be used in combat. While more useful for platforming, during combat this can be a most effective way of dealing damage especially to enemies at range. As someone who's been turned off to the metroidvania genre in the past due to issues with combat systems, playing one where platforming takes center stage got me to enjoy the base game and sucked into why this genre can be so addicting to play. Backtracking is a huge yet contentious part of the metroidvania genre. If done poorly, it can lead to monotonous pacing and overall frustration, but if done well, it can heighten the enjoyment overall. Ori's level design is superb, always leaving a lasting impression with tricky platforming sections that test the player's skills, and unique visuals that help them stand out. Moon Studios co-founder Thomas Mahler stated in an interview with The Verge, you don't get too far if your designs are too abstracted, so you're really forced to create something more memorable, because players remembering the levels is part of the core design. I believe this is done to great effect because of Ori's reduced scope as compared to its contemporaries. This might sound a bit counterintuitive, but Ori keeps things simple enough when it's designed, while still nailing its Metroidvania gameplay by segmenting its world between areas. Instead of the game being an open-ended, more non-linear experience, where areas are accessed in whatever order the player chooses, Ori instead opts for a more linear direction. While the world is interconnected and players are free to roam wherever they'd like, there's a clear path through the game, keeping it focused and establishing a pace that complements the story. Backtracking isn't much of an issue, as abilities tend to open shortcuts throughout some of the larger areas of Nibel. For example, fighting your way into the depths of the sunken glades, only to obtain the climbing ability and climb your way back up. Warping can also be used to get from one area of the map to another with ease. Just like with open world games, I'd recommend traveling the world on foot to get a sense of your surroundings and get to know every nook and cranny. Each section has its own map, which is updated in real time as you explore. The entire map can be unveiled if you collect a map stone fragment. 
Completing the map stone in each area reveals the entire map, even secret areas. This is a huge incentive, at least for me, considering exploring and finding more goodies is some of the most fun I've had with Ori. Along with that central hub of sorts, there are three major areas the player will have to travel to in order to free the aforementioned spirits. The Jinso Tree to free the element of water, the Forlorn Ruins to free the element of winds, and Mount Horu to free the element of warmth. Each area is distinct from one another in not only visual style, but the gameplay mechanics therein. Each area is unique from both a gameplay and visual standpoint, which is key for the Metroidvania genre when players are tasked with traversing the same ground multiple times throughout the adventure. The Black Root Burrows has this neat light mechanic that reveals platforms. The Sorrow Pass has players riding on wind currents. The Misty Woods has this trippy and ever-changing environmental puzzle. Each area is memorable not only visually, but design-wise, making backtracking less of a hassle. Each of the said regions has a central temple, for lack of a better word, where players have to solve numerous puzzles and platforming challenges in order to free each elemental spirit. This is where the parallels with the Zelda franchise start to come into play. The Forlorn Ruins contains interesting anti-gravity puzzles, the Jinso Tree implements Pac-Man-like portals to traverse, and Mount Horu involves lava puzzles and utilizes almost every mechanic the game has to offer. These areas usually culminate in the penultimate chase or escape sequence that puts your platforming skills to the test. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with these sections. On one hand, they're visually spectacular. With the score setting the tone, these set pieces can be exhilarating. On the other hand, you have to complete them in one shot, employing a lot of trial and error as you never know what to expect. It can be frustrating, but the final attempt where everything comes together, the music, the visuals, the platforming, it can be extremely satisfying. Just prepare to die a few times to get the hang of it. I genuinely like the overall design structure of the Blind Forest, as it's still a Metroidvania at heart, but becomes vastly more approachable thanks to its more focused level design. There's just enough secrets and areas to find and explore in the main hub that you're always being engaged. With the one direct path through the game, the way forward is always clear after exhausting all options and you're never stuck with a bunch of items or abilities wondering which way to go, or being overwhelmed with several different pathways to take, or bogged down with abilities you can't use effectively yet. This is exemplified in the world events that occur. These take the Metroidvania concept to the extreme, where completing the aforementioned temples changes the world of Nibel in one way or another, opening up more of the world for players to explore. For example, restoring the water vein at the Jinso Tree will send clean, fresh water flowing throughout the region, now making the once toxic waters of Nibel navigable once more. It's an overall sense of progression from the smallest to the largest aspect that makes Ori so engaging. Obtaining the ability to double jump and immediately running through your head the areas you've passed through that needed it, to restoring the winds to the world, giving old areas new means of traversal, is an organic world that continues to grow from both a gameplay and story standpoint, perfectly intertwining and getting you invested in Ori and her travels. If you've been paying attention throughout most of the video, you've probably noticed all of this here. Ori in the Blind Forest is a visual tour de force. It might even be the most gorgeous game I've ever played, which is no surprise given its incredible art design and direction. It feels like you're playing a high quality CG movie movie on par with Pixar at times, all at 60 frames per second. Each area feels diverse and packed with detail. There are multiple layers to Ori's visual presentation, with foreground and background elements that give much needed depth to its 2D design. It's very much an organic world, with set elements reacting to the player's actions that add that small touch in making Nibel feel more believable. And the kicker? This is all done in the Unity engine. Ori's beauty is complemented perfectly with its score. British composer Gareth Coker composed Ori's soundtrack, and the results are pure magic. In tandem with the Nashville Studio Orchestra, Coker experimented with varying instruments to match the locales of the game, giving each area its own unique feel while staying with one central theme. The range is incredible, with big sweeping chase themes, quieter pieces, and uplifting compositions to match any tone the game sets. Ori's quality soundtrack garnered praise from fans and critics alike, netting Coker the DICE Award for Outstanding Music Composition, as well as the Golden State award for best audio. Needless to say, Ori's soundtrack is incredible. Whether it's lack of vocabulary or the only appropriate word to use, I've described many games as beautiful, but that was primarily when it came to its visuals. Ori in the Blind Forest as a game is what I would describe as beautiful, as all its moving parts coalesce in a gorgeous looking, emotionally moving, and engaging experience only video games can pull off. From its movement and gameplay, the story and characters, and the astounding visuals, the Blind Forest is a spectacular game. With their debut title, Moon Studios has proven to not only be talented but passionate about their craft, creating an incredibly memorable journey worthy of being in the same conversation as Microsoft's upper echelon titles.